Hey everyone, today's lesson is on Factor V Leiden. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about what this condition is. We're also gonna talk about some of the pathophysiology behind this condition. We're also gonna talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how we can diagnose it and how we can treat it. So Factor V Leiden is an autosomal dominant hematologic condition involving an increased risk of thromboses. So what that means is that it is autosomal dominant, which means that you only need one copy of an allele which is a version of a gene. You only need one copy in order to actually experience symptoms of this condition. And it's a hematologic condition, so it's a blood condition involving increased risk of thrombosis, so an increased risk of clotting. And we're gonna talk about why that is in the next slide. It is caused by a point mutation on factor five. So factor five is part of the coagulation cascade. And we call these the FVL mutations. And one in particular is the R506Q mutation. And factor V Leiden also exhibits what we call incomplete penetrance. So even though factor V Leiden is an autosomal dominant condition, which means that it only needs one affected allele to exhibit this condition, every person that has an affected allele doesn't necessarily have to get this condition. So that's what that means. So people that have this condition really only need to have one affected allele, but not every single person that has one affected allele will actually have this condition. And this is actually the most common inherited thrombophilic condition among Caucasians. So it's the most common inherited condition involving an increased risk of clotting. And some estimates actually state that there's upwards of three to 7% of Caucasians are actually heterozygotes for this condition. So being a heterozygote means that they have one affected allele, doesn't necessarily mean that they have symptoms of factor V Leiden because of its incomplete penetrance, but it means that they have one affected allele that they could pass on to their offspring. And there may be as little as 5% of heterozygotes will actually have issues with venous thromboemboli. So even though there's a high percentage of Caucasian population that has one affected allele, only 5% of these heterozygotes will actually have an issue with clotting or issues with venous thromboemboli. There's significant differences between those with one affected allele and those with two affected alleles. So in heterozygous individuals, people that have one affected allele, again, this is an autosomal dominant condition, which means that you only need one affected allele to be affected by this condition. That increases your risk for thrombosis by sevenfold. So it's a sevenfold increased risk of thrombosis. However, if you have two affected alleles, you're a homozygous individual, you have a, a very high risk of thrombosis. In fact, 20-fold increased risk of thrombosis can occur with homozygous individuals. So what is the pathophysiology of this condition? We talked about factor V being a part of the coagulation cascade. It is a coagulation factor that is synthesized in the liver. And what happens in the coagulation cascade, and this is just a brief summary of what happens with factor V. If you want more information on the coagulation cascade, please check out my lessons on those topics. So what happens is thrombin will actually lead to the activation of factor V to activated factor V. So factor 5A, that's the activated factor 5. So thrombin activates factor 5. And once activated factor 5 is formed, it can lead to the completion of the coagulation cascade leading to formation of a fibrin clot. Now there's also another important protein that is also synthesized in the liver and that is protein C. And what normally happens in the coagulation cascade in a normal individual is that activated protein C inhibits activated factor 5. So activated protein C inhibits activated factor V to regulate the coagulation cascade because we don't want the coagulation cascade to go out of control and lead to formation of too many fibrin clots. However, in factor V Leiden, that R506Q mutation, activated factor V is resistant to inhibition by activated protein C. So we call this activated protein C resistance. And sometimes you might see that term used for the condition of factor V Leiden because activated protein C cannot inhibit activated factor V in factor V Leiden. So this inhibition process is inhibited and that leads to an increased coagulation cascade and increased formation of fibrin clots or thromboses. So what are some of the clinical features of factor V Leiden? So number one is that there's an increased risk of venous thromboembolism or VTE. We've talked about the 
increased risk depending on if the individual is a heterozygote or a homozygote, but there is an increased risk in factor V Leiden. Again, many individuals with factor V Leiden will have no venous thromboembolism, so they might have the allele, but it's not completely penetrant, so they might have factor V Leiden, but not really experience the symptoms of it. Most common places where we're going to see VTEs is the deep vein of the leg. So we see deep vein thrombosis, so DVT, with subsequent pulmonary embolism. So you can see one leg being larger than the other in a DVT. You may also see some isolated pulmonary embolism in rare cases, but again, I, most of the time you're going to see a DVT with a subsequent pulmonary embolism. And in addition to deep vein thromboses, we may see some superficial vein thromboses as well in the legs, and this can be what it looks like. So what are some other clinical features and findings of Factor V Leiden? So individuals with Factor V Leiden who do exhibit symptoms of the condition are at an increased risk of Bud Chiari syndrome. So Bud Chiari is where there is a clot that occurs in the hepatic vein, and this can lead to a host of issues, including damage to the liver. Now, we can also see an increased risk of cerebral vein thrombosis as well in individuals with factor V Leiden who are on oral contraceptive pills. That's where we tend to see this association. We may also see a small increased risk of arterial thromboembolism with factor V Leiden. So what I've talked about before occurs in veins not in arteries, but what we do see is that there may be a small increased risk of arterial thromboembolism with patients who are exhibiting symptoms of factor V Leiden. Again, majority of the time it's going to occur in veins and deep veins of the legs more specifically, and we might see some in different areas of the body as well, but we may see some clots forming in arteries, and that can cause a lot of problems itself. This can include increased risk of coronary artery disease, an increased risk of stroke in young women who smoke specifically. So we can see that there may be some increased risk in young women who smoke who have this condition. And there's this question of, is there an increased risk of recurrent late pregnancy losses in factor V Leiden as well? So when we see recurrent late pregnancy losses or recurrent pregnancy losses in general, we often think of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. But it could be that this condition might be the culprit. So what really happens is that because there's this increased risk of clot formation, these clots can get into placental vessels and essentially lead to pregnancy losses. So there may be some evidence that factor V Leiden can lead to late pregnancy losses. So how do we diagnose and how do we treat this condition? So diagnosis of factor V Leiden oftentimes starts with suspecting the condition if there are venous thromboemboli in abnormal locations. And the abnormal locations you want to think about are the cerebral veins. So we talked about there's an increased risk of cerebral vein thromboses occurring in this condition and the portal vein. So I mentioned the hepatic vein, but the portal vein could also be affected as well. Now, what we do tend to follow is the guideline that testing is usually not performed in the first episode of a provoked VTE. So if there's a provoked uh, DVT or a provoked pulmonary embolism, or if there's a first VTE in age greater than 50 years old, testing for this condition is not often performed right away. And when you do lead to testing, if there's you know multiple episodes of provoked VTE, or if there's a VTE in an abnormal location, you can move on to genetic testing. That is a way to actually detect factor V Leiden. We look at doing PCR to detect the FVL mutation that we talked about before. We can also do a functional activated protein C assay. So again, activated protein C is the protein that is actually inhibiting activated factor V, and it doesn't work in factor V Leiden. So we can do that assay. But once you do this assay anyway, you're going to have to do a genetic test to oftentimes confirm the diagnosis. So a lot of times you're going to move on to genetic testing anyways. And once you have diagnosed an individual with factor V Leiden, you're going to want to screen their family for this condition because it is an autosomal dominant condition. So if they have factor V Leiden, at least one of their parents also has it. 
and their siblings might have it and perhaps some of their children might have it. So you're going to want to look through the family and check to make sure other family members don't have this condition either. And once this condition is diagnosed, it is often treated with a direct oral anticoagulant or a DOAC. So things like apixaban or rivaroxaban or warfarin can also be used to treat this condition as well. And the length of time of anticoagulant therapy is often the same as the general population, unless there are multiple unprovoked VTEs, or if there's a VTE in an abnormal location, or if the VTE is in, an, is in a life-threatening location, the individual who has factor V Leiden is often put on indefinite anticoagulation. So again, diagnosis of factor V Leiden usually starts with suspecting it in the first place, due to a VTE or a thrombus forming in an abnormal location like the cerebral vein or a portal vein or the hepatic vein. And then genetic testing is often performed looking to detect that FVL mutation we talked about before. And then family screening is also important to detect if anybody else in the family also has this condition. And once factor V Leiden has been diagnosed, it is often treated with a direct oral anticoagulant, a DOAC or warfarin, and the amount of time for anticoagulation is usually the same as the general population unless there are multiple unprovoked VTEs or a VT in an abnormal location or if it's life-threatening. In that case, it would be indefinite anticoagulation therapy. So if you want to learn more about other hematology conditions, please check out my hematology playlist. And if you found this lesson helpful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. And also please check out my Patreon page for other exclusive lessons as well. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.